The Grim Reaper. The one that controls death. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it. But what if it was you? What if you controlled life and death? How would you go about the job? How would you deal with knowing exactly when every living thing's time was up? One hell of a question, isn't it? And one that's pondered in tonight's story. Because it is a dirty job and someone indeed does have to do it. So my dear friends, another fantastic one from Dr. Creeper's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all with you. And once again, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. As the anniversary of my mother's death approaches, like every year before it, I have the overwhelming urge to get blackout drunk for as long as I can. In the past, it usually began on the Friday after work and continued through the weekend before the pressures of society forced me to sober up so that I can drive and go to work on Monday. But this year is different. It's different because I now have a wife so wonderful that I don't think I deserve her. On top of that, I'm even more blessed with a tiny bundle who has her mother's eyes. And in the delivery room, when I first laid eyes on her, I swore that I would become the best father that I could possibly be. As such, I refused to touch a drop of alcohol, much less partake in my annual self-destructive weekend. Yet, what I witnessed, what I learned, what I inflicted upon my friend... I can't keep it all bottled up, so this year I've decided to write it down and share it. Hopefully, this will do the same job that three bottles of whiskey would do in the past. To start with, I grew up in a small rural town in upstate New York. My father was a foreman for a local construction company, and my mother ran a florist shop near the centre of town. The community was small and close, and so my best friend was my next door neighbour. His name was Gabriel Messerim. An Italian boy, as dark as I was fair. We were both into exploring, causing mischief, all the typical things young boys are interested in. Because of our close bond, our families also became close. By the time we were nine years old, we considered both sets of parents as one whole parental unit. And I listened to and respected Mrs. Messerem as much as my own mother. Mr. Messerem, Sam as he later told me to call him, didn't look or act anything like you might expect the Grim Reaper would. A TV and movie show a gaunt or skeletal figure in a dark cloak, carrying a scythe. The Bible says that the Reaper is actually an angel, but Sam was a middle-aged, balding, short man with a thick moustache, twinkling eyes, and a laugh that sounded like it could come from Santa. Out of the four parents Gabe and I shared, he was the favourite of us both. He would sneak us sweets, let us stay up during sleepovers, would take us hiking and fishing, and would always have a joke or a smart remark up his sleeve. It was the perfect disguise, and it worked for over a decade. I was 15 years old when I found out the truth. Gabe and I remained fast friends as we grew up. During my sophomore year in high school, my family's dog, Roy, who had grown up with me and Gabe, started having his health decline. He was an old boy, and no one knew when his body would finally give out. And yet, a week before his death, Gabe had told me randomly as we sat on the school bus, Hey, I think you should treat Roy as best you can this week. I gave him a confused look, and he merely said, This is going to be his last week, so, you know, I think if you want to, like, treat him to stuff... You should do it now. I asked him how he knew this was going to be Roy's last week alive. But he just shook his head. Just trust me. So I did just that. Roy lived like a king for a week. And then, after seven days, just like Gabe had said, he passed away peacefully. I was distraught. But even more so, I was awestruck about how Gabe knew when Roy would die. I was grieving for a while, so I didn't bring it up for a few weeks after Roy's death. However, time went on, and while I was still sad, my curiosity about Gabe's insight into Roy's death day eventually became too much to contain. 
One day, while Gabe was hanging out with me in my room playing video games, I cracked. Gabe, I've been meaning to ask you. How the hell did you know that Roy was going to die? What can I say? He was an old dog. He responded absently. But I wasn't just going to take that. Well, yeah, but you knew he had only one week left. Literally. How could you know that? When he didn't respond and continue playing our game, I paused it and turned to face him, trying to make my face as serious and threatening as possible. Gabe, tell me, how did you know that Roy was going to die in a week? Gabe faced me, his stare as intense as the one I was giving him. What well, seemed like a few minutes, we had a stare down, each waiting for the other to break and blink. My desire to know the truth was strong, and so it was eventually Gabe that broke eye contact and sighed. If, if I tell you, you have to swear on your immortal soul that you will not tell anyone. Do you swear? I nodded, and Gabe took a moment to compose himself. Finally, he spoke. My dad is the Grim Reaper. He told me when Roy was going to die so that I could prepare to see you depressed for a while and not be able to do anything about it. I blinked a few times, trying to process what he was saying to me. Was Gabe mocking me? Did he do something to Roy and was trying to cover for it? Why would he tell such a blatant lie to me after he made me swear on my immortal soul not to tell anyone? I couldn't decide on a reason and ended up just sighing. <sighs> Look, man. If you don't want to tell me, that's fine, but you don't have to make up something that stupid. I'm not lying, dude. My dad really is the Grim Reaper. <laughs> really? He seems to have a lot of meat on his bones for being a skeleton guy with a scythe. <laughs> also, I've been to where your dad works. Are you trying to tell me the Grim Reaper works at a power plant as an engineer? I could see Gabe getting flustered at my disbelief. I don't know why he works there. But he is the Grim Reaper. He's shown me proof. You told me you'd tell me more when the time was right, but I swear he's the Grim Reaper. <laughs> he's shown you proof. I was getting agitated about how far Gabe was taking this lie. What proof did he show you? Does he keep his black cloak in your coat closet? <laughs> did he teleport you around and show you him killing things? Uh, for supposedly being the son of death. Well, you seem pretty normal. Shouldn't you have, like, cosmic powers or something? Gabe threw down his controller. Pretty pissed at this point. <sighs> Screw you, man. I open up to you like this and you throw it back into my face. Fuck this, I'm out. And with that, he stood up and stormed out of my room. I called after him. Good. I don't want to be talking to a lying prick anyway. Things were awkward for around two weeks. Gabe and I refused to even look at each other, much less talk to one another. Our parents quickly picked up on this and trying to find out was wrong, but both of us were very tight-lipped about our fight. Things changed on a Friday night. I was taking the garbage out to the can at the corner of our driveway. I didn't even hear Mr. Messerin walking next to me, taking his garbage to his garbage can when I turned around to go back inside. Seeing him standing a few feet away from me made me jump in fright. <sighs> Sorry to scare you, champ, he said in a friendly voice when he saw my reaction. Oh, no worries, Sam. I just didn't see you there, I said, giving him a friendly smile back. As I looked at him, Gabe's claims about who and what he was came back to me, and I couldn't help but give a little chuckle. <sighs> What's up? He asked, confused a little about, about what I was laughing at. Oh, nothing. Just something Gabe said. Mm, speaking of which, you and Gabe have had this little tiff for quite a while now. Want to tell me what happened? I sighed, not wanting to drag up the fight again. Oh, it's just something Gabe said about the whole situation with Roy. I'm still a little bit sad about him dying, and Gabe said something that Made me a little sore, that's all. Silence was my response. 
and Mr. Mesram was looking at me as though he were trying to read my mind. This was the first time I was freaked out by Mr. Mesram in my entire life. He wasn't an intimidating man, but from him just staring at me, I felt fear for some reason start to form in the pit of my stomach. What did Gabriel say? He finally asked, his voice devoid of humour and the usual charm that accompanied it. This only made the terror growing inside of me flare up, and I could have sworn that Mr. Messerum grew a little taller and more menacing. He told me a week before Roy passed that he was going to die in a week. Then, when I asked him about how he knew, he made up some ridiculous lie. It's not even worth mentioning. I began to turn to go back inside when Mr. Masserum stopped me. Suddenly, with a deep and hollow voice, he said, He told you I was the Grim Reaper, didn't he? I stood, frozen. I'd never heard Mr. Masserum sound like that before in my life, even on the rare occasions when I heard him and he was angry. His voice didn't even seem possible for a human to create. The anxiety within my stomach spread to my limbs, and for some reason I began to quake where I stood. There was no way this was happening, but when I slowly turned my head to look back at him, he was standing right behind me. The man whom I normally stood a few inches taller than, now towering over me, staring at me with eyes that no longer twinkled, but pierced with an icy force like icicles. Though my mind was racing as fast as my heart was beating, my loyalty to Gabe came forth in that moment, and I squeaked out, No, sir, and even if he did, I saw on my soul I wouldn't tell anyone. An instant later, Mr. Masseron was back to his usual, smaller, jolly self. He put his hand on my shoulder and gave me a warm smile. You're a good lad, and a good friend. Gabe is lucky to have you. He patted my shoulder. Let's have a talk in the backyard in five. I nodded, and we both went into our separate houses. I told my folks Mr. Masserum wanted to talk to me, and five minutes later, I was in his backyard, sitting next to him on their patio porch swing. To my surprise, he offered me a beer. I took it, of course, and we drank quietly for a while, watching the sun set in the west. Eventually, he broke the silence. I am a Grim Reaper. This caused me to cough out the beer I was in the middle of swallowing. I leaned forward, coughing, and Mr. Masserum patted my back, laughing. Careful now. It'd be embarrassing to choke to death the moment after meeting him. I sputtered and caught my breath. <sighs> okay, <laughs> did Gabe put you up to this? I finally managed to say, but he shook his head. Nope. In fact, he doesn't even know we're talking. But you're a smart kid, and eventually you'd start noticing coincidences that you wouldn't be able to explain. But then Gabe's words would come back to you, and suspicion would fester in your heart. Some sadness crept into his smile. You don't deserve that. So I'm taking the executive privilege to tell you the truth here and now. I stared at him incredulously, trying to find words, but unable to. <sighs> it's okay. I know it's hard to believe, but just hear me out. Mr. Masserum sucked in a deep breath and began his explanation. My family has been the Grim Reaper since the dawn of life. Obviously, we weren't always human. But the whole Grim Reaper thing doesn't quite work how TV and movies and stories says it does. I myself don't pop up to every single death that occurs in the universe to shepherd the souls to the next life or anything. I'm more like a conduit of death. He looked to me to see if I understood what he meant. I obviously didn't, and so he continued to explain. I'm sure by now in science class, you've learned about atoms how, by themselves, they're just inanimate pieces of matter, and yet somehow these atoms come together and form life. Mr. Masserum looked up into the night sky. Life is created from lack of life, and the Grim Reaper is 
the opposite of that. From life comes the lack of life. And while life takes on trillions of forms, death needs only one. Because I exist, and because I am alive, death exists in this universe, and life is balanced out. Are you a god? I choked out, and he looked back down at me. No, nothing like that. I don't even know if there is one. But I don't think a balance like me was created just out of chaos and chance. As I said, my family has been the Grim Reaper from the start of life. I can trace myself back to the first single-cell organism that was chosen by whatever or whomever to be the being that allowed death to exist. I am still human, for the most part. I sat staring at the ground, the half-finished beer in my hands long forgotten. For the most part? I asked, and he nodded again. There are two things that separate me from everyone else. The first thing is that when I inherited the mantle of death, I saw all the possible deaths that would happen in my lifetime. You can see the future, I cut in. And he shrugged. Uh, it's complicated. String theory has it sort of right when it comes to different realities. Well, they're wrong in the idea that literally every single eventuality is possible. But I would say that every person has about five or six decisions in their life that has major impacts on their timeline. I've seen the end results for each of those decisions for every living thing in existence. Mr. Masram rubbed his forehead with his free hand. If my father hadn't prepared me for it, and if it weren't for my wife and child, I think it would have gone insane a long time ago. <laughs> Speaking of children, that brings me to my second point of difference. His smile disappeared. I am effectively immortal until my child is ready to take up the responsibility of being the Grim Reaper. Usually, that's the age of 14. We've had one instance in history where a teenager became deaf, Unprepared by her father, and he did not end well. The current death always does their best to prepare the next one for the burden they'll have to carry. I stared at him, awestruck. You mean that... the Gabe? I trailed off, and he nodded. Yes, one day Gabe will become the conduit for all death in the universe. That's why I'm happy he has you as a friend. When I die, he'll need all the support he can get, and you will be invaluable. Mr. Masram patted my shoulder and finished off his beer. My mind just couldn't accept what I'd been told, so I decided to test him. Sam, if you've seen the death of everything, can you describe to me what Roy experienced at his death? I asked slyly. Mr. Masram closed his eyes and sat pondering for a moment. He was content, he finally said. He still had the taste of the strawberry ice cream you gave him that morning on his tongue. And though he missed you, as he always did when you were at school, he closed his eyes with a happy expectation to see you again, like he always did when you got home from school. I stared at Mr. Masram, barely aware of the tears that had begun to form in my eyes. There's no way he could have known I slipped Roy ice cream that fateful morning. I've gone out of my way to make sure it was a secret treat. Mr. Masram ruffled my hair affectionately as more tears began to fall from my eyes. It never gets easier, he said softly. And I wish I could change the rules about who lives and who dies. But I can't. Well, can't you tell people about when and how their loved ones will die? Wouldn't that change the future? I sobbed, wiping my tears away and trying to calm down. I could think of nothing crueler to do to those I cared about, he responded. Just because you have knowledge doesn't mean you'll have the power to change things. He stood up from the porch swing and stretched. The sun finally set and his backyard lights turned on automatically. I do hope our little chat cleared some things up for you. You'll make up with Gabe and continue being friends with him. I nodded numbly, still trying to take in everything that had just happened. I think Anthony Hopkins said it best when he said, 
none of us are getting out of here alive. So please stop treating yourself like an afterthought. Eat the delicious food. Walk in the sunshine. Jump in the ocean. Say the truth that you're carrying in your heart like hidden treasure. Be silly. Be kind. Be weird. There is no time for anything else. Well, I really think he hit the nail on the head with that one. And with that, Mr. Masroom went inside to join his family. I sat in their backyard for a long time after that, before finally heading back to my own house. The next day, I made out with Gabe, and life went back to normal. I was still up in the air about Mr. Masroom truly being death incarnate, but I acted like we'd never had that talk, and everything was fine. Summer came, and with it, all the great things that come with summer vacation. Gabe and I spent our time living as fast and as fun as we could, and it never seemed enough. Another fantastic summer was flying by, and I hoped that my meeting with death had been just a little blip that I'd soon forget within all the wonderful memories being created. But now, I know I will never forget that first meeting. Nor will I forget the second one, either. Ten years ago, on June 19th, 2009, my mother was hit by a drunk driver as she went on an early morning walk. She laid on the side of the road, bleeding out for two hours before another car noticed her and called for an ambulance. It was too late, and my mother passed on the way to the hospital. Never had I been filled with such grief and rage. I was inconsolable, bottling up all my emotions, not knowing an outlet for them, until I saw Mr. Masseram at the funeral. This man, this person I'd viewed as a friend to my family, a second father even, supposedly knew when my mother was going to die, and could have done something to stop it, and yet he didn't do a thing. I knew then I'd found my outlet. I waited for a few days, and when I thought that Gabe and his mother weren't home, but he was, I went over in the middle of the day. He opened the door with a smile, but it quickly vanished when he saw my father's loaded handgun in my hands with the muzzle pointed at him. I ushered him inside, telling him to sit on his couch and close the door. With his hands raised, he began to try to speak to me, but I cut him off. You knew she was going to die. You knew she was going to die on the side of the road, and you did nothing. You could have told her not to go walking that day, or try a different road, but you didn't. You didn't try to save my mother. Why? Because I'm not allowed to, he said softly, and his collected demeanor only pissed me off more. Then tell me who did it. You must at least know what the car looked like, or who was driving it. Tell me. I can't do that either. Why not? I cried out. And Mr. Masseram gave me a pitiful look. Because of balance. You do not know who did it, and I cannot interfere with that knowledge or lack thereof. It had changed both of your futures. And that's not allowed. It's part of the ties that bind me. I moved in closer and held the gun mere inches from his face. Bullshit, I spat. I don't fucking believe you. I remember what you said. You don't know if there's even a god, yet somehow you have all these rules. I think you wanted her to die. I don't know why, but there's no other reason why you just sit there and spoon me all this crap. Please, don't do this, he said quietly. I haven't prepared Gabe properly yet. He doesn't deserve what happens next if you pull that trigger. What happens next is why I spent my mother's death anniversary, up till now, drinking to forget. I don't want to remember any of it. I don't want to remember hearing Gabe's surprised voice from the stairwell cry out, Dad! I don't want to remember the noise suddenly startling me, and in my alarm my finger accidentally pulling the trigger. I don't want to remember the sound of the gunshot and the spray of blood and gore that erupted from the back of Mr. Messram's head. Most of all, I want to scrub out the memory of the purple fog that seemed to rise out of every pore of Mr. Masram's body. Though 
it was only in front of me for a second or so. I looked into the massive cloud of fated and divine substance, and the visions of the eight possible ways I was going to die that have forever been branded within my brain. The moment passed, and as my eyes began to bleed, and temporary insanity flooded my brain, shutting down my consciousness as a defense mechanism, I can faintly remember Gabe's piercing shrieks, and in my fading vision, I saw the fog enveloping Gabe, slowly working its way into his body as he screamed for his mother and father, and begged for the visions to stop. Everything goes dark from there. I awoke a week later in the hospital, my distraught father keeping vigil beside my bed. I learned the official story soon after, that someone had broken into the Masram house while I was there, shot Mr. Masram, knocked me out, kidnapped Gabe and set the house on fire. The only reason I survived was an anonymous tip that had been called in to 911 and the fire department had gotten there in time to pull me out before the heat and smoke had killed me. No gun was found at the scene, and from the apparent brain damage I'd suffered, the cops didn't expect me to remember anything at all. But they were wrong. I hope Gabe is out there, having a good life. I hope he's found a family like his father did, and settled down into a nice place to raise children. I hope his mind is not permanently shattered by the visions of God knows how many deaths that would take place during his lifetime. I hope he's found peace and beauty in his time alive on this earth. What I hope most is to avoid a certain situation, an eighth situation, where, as an old man, I answer my front door. It's a cool summer day in June. The birds are singing. The clouds are white and fluffy. The smell of my wife's cherry pie baking is wafting through the air. As the door opens, I see through my thick glasses a face I'd never thought I'd see again. Wrinkled with time and experience, but still recognizable to me. His mouth, filled with rotting and disgusting teeth, is in the form of a malicious grin. And his eyes, so like his father's, are filled with a cold hatred instead of a twinkle. One hand holds himself up on a cane, while the other holds an ancient, yet recognizable pistol, once thought lost, shiny and buffered to look like new. It is aimed right at my forehead, and in the second before the trigger is pulled, and the world goes black, I realize that I stand before the Reaper of Souls, and he has come for me. Oh, a very, very interesting concept there tonight. What do you think of that one? I mean, if it was your job, what would you do? You couldn't just um, help your friends out just because they happen to be your friends. You have to let the universe go by its own laws. Or do you? Well, thoughts, feelings, and anything else in the comment section below the video. And as ever, I'll do my best to answer as many as I can. Well, that's enough for me for one evening, but I'll be back again very soon. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?